This image is Gambian celebrating the end of a military junta that has ruled our country for more than two decades, and we celebrated in 2017. The dictator of our country, Yaya Jame, has seized power in 1994, two years before I was born. My childhood, like most Gambians, is filled with seeing a powerful man on our billboards and our screens and everywhere you turned. It was about standing in the scorching hot sun whilst you waited for a presidential expensive fleet of cars to pass by, part of your responsibilities as a citizen of that country. Besides all of that beautiful appearance of a man that was designated by God to lead us, behind all of that was the execution of political prisoners, of stifling freedom of speech, the disappearance of our journalists, citizens who couldn't express how they really felt. But I was just only seven, maybe nine years old at the time. My first experience in realizing there is danger around me, but not really and fully understanding that I lived in a dictatorship, was when I was in nursery school. The government at the time had cracked down on students in 2002. Students who came out to protest against the rape and violence committed against a young student. The government not wanting the international community to understand what was going on in this small West African country decided to gun down, kill, torture, and arrest a lot of students from university to college and to high schools. Did I understand that context? No. Did I understand the nuance of what was happening? No. All I remembered was my mother running to the school premises to pick her child, so as many other parents. And the narrative at the time was, there are gunshots and we need to protect our kids. Gambia is a majority Muslim country, a country that vows itself to be peaceful. The dictatorship at the time doing a great job at masking what it really did to political leaders that came before him. He took power in a military coup right after we had come from colonialism into our self-identity as a sovereign state. Nobody talked about what was happening. In fact, not most people knew what was happening in the country because we are a small population within the eyes of the international community. So it was easier to mask human rights violations in and out by claiming to cure HIV and AIDS. Yaya Jame, the dictator at the time, claimed to cure HIV and AIDS and cancer with herbal medicine. So instead of the international community and journalists focusing on the human rights violations of arrest of political dissidents, of people that spoke out against the military junta, instead and rather they focused on whether he could cure HIV and AIDS or cancer. Growing up, just like my parents, I was very naive to the realities of my country. We were supposed to be the smiling coast. Growing up in a polygamous home, I had so much to worry about, like studying, sharing the bed with my other siblings, worrying about everyday life as a teenager in a third world country. However, in 2014, at the prime of the dictatorship, I had finished high school as a teenager, 18 years old. I decided to participate in a scholarship pageant sponsored by the dictatorship the government at the time, promised to study anywhere in the world, whether it's this university or university in America or in Europe, anywhere, fully funded by my government. And I saw this as an opportunity to escape home, to break the cycle, to make sure I am not one of the number of young African Muslim Gambians who are married off at the age of 14 or 15 
This was an opportunity to break the cycle, to bring home a sense of clarity, and that as a young girl, I can make it. I can go to university, and I can change my country. I stood proud on this day, I remember, winning Miss Gambia, being assured of a future full of possibilities to become whatever it is that I want to become. And instead, the president who was supposed to be a father figure, whose crimes I've been unaware of at 18 years old, decided to propose marriage to me. Because within my culture and cons a construct, it is okay to do that for older men to marry younger teenagers. But being raised by powerful young African women who did not understand what it is to be a feminist, but understood that they could say yes and no, has taught me the word no. No, I don't want to. No, excuse me, not yet. Not understanding that I lived in a dictatorship, not understanding the power of the man that stood in front of me when he proposed to me, as a matter of fact, I want to marry you. I said no, naively, just like many other women around the world who say no, do not touch me, no, I do not give you access. It doesn't matter what language they speak or where they come from. But within my context, I said no to a dictator. And a dictator who's never heard no, where people killed at his orders, where people disappeared at his pleasure, where journalists were muted and murdered because he wanted to, could not understand why a young girl from a poor family background in a third world country would say no to his proposal. He could not understand that. And a man so powerful with an 18-year-old girl who did not understand the naivety and the realities of her country. Within that context, he decided to rape me. The president, the dictator of the Gambia, violated me as a teenager. Where do you say that? How do you explain it? To whom do you express these feelings in a country that is within a dictatorship? No one says anything. No one has opinions that are publicly expressed. I went home, a broken teenager. The dreams of my family and my mother and all the matriarchy before me shattered the idea that a woman can say no. An idea that a woman has autonomy over her body went out the window. As I stood there, I've been violated by the most powerful man that has ever existed. The only man in power that I know. So I decided to walk away. I decided to run away. I became a refugee in a neighboring country. Canada, kind enough to take me in as a protected person and a refugee. I came into a country that I did not study, a country I did not understand, a culture that I could not resonate to. But I had to build my life all over again in shame and in silence because it's a culture where there's a taboo about private parts, intimacy. You cannot say I've been raped and by who? The dictator of my country who ruled for more than two decades. I tried to find myself, I tried to study. I could not speak out. I became that bold girl that sat in the back of the classroom, the silent girl who had nothing to say. My opinions were muffled. But I tried to learn about my country for the first time to understand that I really lived in a dictatorship, that my people couldn't voice their opinions, that people died, that politicians were not treated fairly, that elections were rigged, that journalists disappeared, that women were being raped in prisons and by the military government. So I spoke out. Because when I sat on a computer to research about other survivors of violence within the Gambia, I could not find examples. I could not find other survivors that I could resonate with, that I could see as a blueprint for my journey. So I decided to speak out. 
at the United Nations, with the New York Times, BBC, investigations by the Human Rights Watch. And it was painful to speak out, but it was important to speak out because for Gambia, we're invisible. A lot of you sitting here today might be like, here in the Gambia for the first time. I've only met two people at this school since I've been here who have been to the Gambia or who know the cultural context of the Gambia. But we are very conservative, talking about private parts and body parts, or even the relationship between human rights and democracy is very rare. We don't talk about it. So I thought it was important to, part, to show the way to other young women to speak out for themselves. In 2019, I spoke out loudly. We organized the first match against violence in the Gambia, not only against violence, but against a dictator. And we mobilized people that believed in the hashtag Me Too, believed in the hashtag I am too far. And part of what we do now is to make sure women's stories, stories of violence, whether within conflict or dictatorships, are central to transitional justice processes, are central to recognizing that democracies only thrive when women's rights are centered, when violence against women is unacceptable no matter where you come from. I have decided to use my voice because I realize the world's interest in me is not because of who I am or the poor fa family background that I come from, but because my perpetrator is a powerful dictator who has robbed soldiers with the most powerful people around the world, from Latin America to America, North America, and the rest of the African continent. I wrote a book, and the reason why I wrote the book is because I wanted young girls and women to resonate with the new ones of my story, to understand that it is possible to speak out, not only speak out, but be an active participant towards democratization of democratic countries, regardless of the abuse that has been committed against you. That your voice as a woman is important, especially coming from a culture where there isn't a word for rape. In my native Gambian language, when I want to say someone has raped me, it comes in phrases as, he robbed off of me, he fell on my thigh, which takes away the heinous nature of abuse and rape and giving yourself access to a body that never granted itself to you. So today, at the top picture is myself. When I was all veiled up, when I believed that education would give me access to progress, when I believed that my no mattered, but it really didn't. So at the center of the foundation we've created, the Tufa Foundation, Home of Visible Survivors, is to let young girls be mentored, to understand, yes, their no's are powerful, but to also educate the community and the culture to understand why no's are possible, why women deserve sovereignty over their own bodies. We have and are working towards a fully functioning women's shelter. Because yes, me too, yes, tell me your story, yes, participate in the democratization of our countries, but if we cannot create safe spaces for women and girls and all survivors of violence, it is almost irresponsible to tell people to tell their stories, to demand women to speak up and speak out. But it is important to also realize that survivors of violence can be pioneers of revolutions, of democracy, of understanding the relationship between democratization and women's movements. So today I stand here proudly to ask you to think about what do you bring to the table in trying to find a connection between women's rights and democratization. To not forget at the center of every revolution, even here in Guatemala, where women who stood their ground, who were principled in ensuring their rights were seen and respected. And thus, the greater achievement of human rights, the greater realization of democratization, and establishments like these institutions were possible because of the defiance 
of women. And today, more important than ever, to remember Iran, to remember women in Nigeria and all around the world, that we have a collective responsibility to center human rights as a catalyst for revolution and democratization. Thank you.